Thanks very much for the introduction and good morning, everyone. So I'm very happy to have this opportunity to discuss this work with all of you. So uh, today I would like to first give a brief overview of PIS, then I'll talk about different methods to construct PIS. And finally, I will share our recent progress about multi ancestry and cross fire bank study evaluating PIs in different diseases. So, first of all, for the past decade, a genome wide association study or GWAS has been used as a very useful tool to study the complex traits and diseases. So there are thousands of uh, treated social laws that have been identified by GWAS. Based on those GWAS findings, there are many uh, useful applications. One of them is uh, genetic prediction. So polygenic risk score, or PIS for short, uh, is uh, the most common tool used for genetic prediction. So PIS, they are actually predictors of the genetic susceptibility of individuals to diseases. So it is actually a score calculated by, uh, for each of the individual. It's a weighted sum of the risk alleles, uh, which can be coded as zero, one, and two. So based on its simple form, it has two main components. The first one is which SNPs and the number of the SNPs included in PIS. The other one is the uh, effect, estimated effect sizes. So both of these two components are coming from GWAS studies. So I'll elaborate on how to calculate uh, for PIS using a toy example for a single individual. So Imagine we have a single SNP, it has three different uh, genotypes. So here we assume G is the risk allele and A is the reference allele. So based on, on the count of the risk allele, we can record the three different genotypes to zero, one, and two. And as shown for individual, we have uh, 100 risk variants. Uh, they, these are visualized by a 10 by 10 grid here. So different colors for each cell are represent different uh, genotypes for the risk variant. So by summing all of the 100 risk variants, uh, the total counts of uh, the individual is 21. If we further assume the, each of the risk covariants, they contribute equal to the disease risk. So this count is actually the reflection of the PIS. So this is a simple toy example of how to calculate PIS for a single individual. Then how PIS will look for the uh, whole population. So for a diseases, we have cases with that status and controls without that status. So similar to the previous tutorial example, here we show different individuals. They assume with uh, 100 uh, disease associated variants and the number above each of the grade is the count of the risk alleles. So we can see uh, not all of the cases they actually carry the uh, risk alleles at any specific uh, risk variant. And even for the uh, controls, we can say some of them, they may have high uh, risk counts and they might be higher than some of the cases. And each of the people in the population, they do have a unique combination of the risk variants. But in general, as PIS, it is a sum of many risk uh, associated loci. So it actually follows a normal distribution for both cases and controls. But the mean of the PIS in cases that are usually higher than the controls. So there is an amount of discussion about uh, the implementation of PIS into health systems. So here, I would like to use uh, heart diseases, coronary artery disease as an example, because the risk prediction for heart diseases uh, is quite well established around the world. 
So these predictors can actually be found in online tools and they are usually combined with other risk information. So as shown by this figure, the YX, X, YX, Y-axis is the C index, uh, which we can interpret as the probability of ranking the case higher than the control. So for the x-axis, the first few draws are the convention risk factors uh, related to coronary artery disease. We can see for those individual risk factors, uh, they have some predictive ability, but they are actually lower than the predictor generated by PIS as pointed out here. But the predictive ability of the convention, the combined conventional risk factors is actually higher than the PIS. But when not combining the risk factors and the PIS, we can improve the predictive power of the model even more. So another interest in global in northern PIS is most notable for diseases uh, that already have population-based screening and the prevention um, program, such as the breast, breast cancer. So for the risk calculator for breast cancer, it can combine different risk factors as shown here. So such as the family history and genetic factors, which is actually PIS here, and lifestyle factors, et cetera. So combining those risk factors, we can create a predictive model and stratify individuals into different levels of risk. So for this, kind of risk stratification can result in um, the screening being focused on a small group of uh, uh, individuals, which can lead to some cost savings. And in each of the groups, we might can personalize the age at first screening. So for the high risk, we might start uh, the first screening at an early age, and we might do some further preventions. So as PIS is a very hot tool recently, the analysis for running PIS is quite simple. So first of all, we will run jewels uh, in the training population to get the estimated effect sizes. So by jewels is always performed um, with estimation errors for the effect sizes and also suffer from other bias such as Banner's cross. So we usually use different uh, PIS methods to reshrink or rescale the effect sizes. And the optimal uh, way to uh, select variants and ways associated with variants is a very active research area. And I will talk about the PIS methods more in the coming section. So when we get the estimated effect sizes, we will create a PRS in the independent test cohort and then evaluate its performance. So there are many different metrics uh, to evaluate the PRS uh, prediction performance and they are kind of interrelated. For quantitative or continuous traits, uh, r square is a very straight, straightforward metric uh, which is the variance explained by PIS coming from the linear regression. And for the binary trace, we usually use shoulder R square, like the commonly used negative star square, which are parallel with the R square in quantitative trace. However, the case proportion in real population is uh, really deviated from 50%. So we will transform the negative star square by counting for the disease prevalence to the liability scale. And another common use metric is AOC, uh, which is the same as the C index we just showed in the coronary artery disease. So it ranges from 0 0.5 to 1. Um, which is the measurement of the model predictive uh, power. And there are more metrics uh, for the evaluation of PIS in um, binary trace, such as uh, the PIS percentile uh, between controls and the cases, and the prevalence of diseases in different uh, PIS percentile. And based on 
the uh, PRS percentiles or sometimes that's the cells, we will usually set some um, arbitrary thresholds to group uh, the PRS into different bins or different strata. And in each of the strata, here uh, is the top 20%, middle 60%, and the bottom 20%. So we can get the corresponding disease prevalence and the corresponding odds. Sometimes we are even interested in more extreme uh, strata like the top 1% or top 5%. So between different PRS strata, we can uh, further calculate its uh, uh, odds ratio. So using different metrics to get observed prediction accuracy, we are kind of wondering how it compares with the theoretical PRS accuracy. So the theoretical PRS accuracy is a function of the uh, variance explained by the uh, subscript, subscript M marker here. And the N in this uh, equation is the G was sum size. So based on this simple equation, we can say if we minimize this part in the denominator, the maximum R square will be close to the, the variance explained by the M marker. So inherently, PIS will have a theoretical upper limit, uh, which is the broad sense of the trait heritability. So it is the uh, var phenotypical variance attributable to all of the genetic factors. But we know uh, for current PRS, they are based on GWAS uh, using genotyped or imputed data. So this uh, broader sense trait heritability is actually further limited to the uh, SNP based heritability, which can be understood as the variance explained by the uh, SNPs included. And as we are using GWAS, uh, we can see there is a term of uh, N here. So PIS accuracy is highly dependent on the sum size as well as the quality of the uh, discovery jewels. So when we want to improve the uh, PIS accuracy, we can either improve the increase the sample size and also we can develop more sophisticated uh, statistical methods to optimize the uh, ways attached to the PIS, so which will be talked about later. But I'll stop here for a while to see whether there are any questions. Thank you so much, Ying. Uh, I don't see any questions yet. So. Okay, cool. Thank you. So I'll go for the PIS construction methods. So uh, as I just mentioned, so the GWAS beta, they are usually estimated with errors. So we will use different PIS methods to reshrink or rescale the uh, effect sizes to optimize the PIS. So here I will start with single trait uh, PIS construction methods. So based on the input for those methods, uh, the first category is individual level based methods. For those methods, they are using individual genotype for each of the uh, individual and each of the SNP. So th those methods include uh, such as bluff, elastic net, lasso, but they will be very time consuming and memory consuming for current large scale biobank. And because they have to access individual level data and they are further limited by the uh, ethical related issues. So to overcome those limitations, uh, nowadays efforts are mainly um, focused on developing the summary level based methods such as P plus T, S plus, PRCS, etc. And for those methods, uh, the input uh, is mainly the uh, GWAS sum state, summary statistics like the effect sizes and their p-value, et cetera. And we will usually need a LD reference panel to provide the correlation information between SNPs uh, in the GWAS. So those LD reference panel can come in from uh, public resources such as 1000 genome with individual level genotypes. And for those methods, they, they, they will be much faster and also memory efficient. So here I want to talk about more about P plus T and PRCS. So 
For P plus T or pruning and thresholding is actually the most common and the simplest uh, PRS construction methods. It can uh, select a subset of LOD independent SNPs. So it involves two steps. The first step is p-value thresholding. So we will give a specific p-value thresholds like uh, indicated by the Run here, so only those SNPs smaller than this p-value threshold will be returned in the following analysis. And the other step is LOD thinning or LOD clamping. So basically, in a certain LOD block, we will pull out SNPs in LOD with the most significant SNPs. So as by, shown by this example, the most significant SNP is the purple one. If we set LDR square of 0 0.6, then those red doors and orange doors in LD higher than 0 0.6 with the purple snip will be removed. Only slips between the purple and the red line will be kept for the analysis. And the whole process of P plus T in a G was will start from the most significant snips and then it will iteratively to the second. Uh, significant uh, until there is no uh, sniff reached the uh, criteria. So the other method I want to talk about is PICS. So it's not like uh, P plus T, which just select a subset of SNPs. PICS, it, it, it can be applied for a genome-wide SNPs because it can join modeling all the genetic markers by accounting for the uh, LOD. So it's actually a basic method um, assuming the continuous shrinkage files. So I won't not go details about the equation, but I want to mention there is a uh, key hyperparameter in PRCS, which is phi. So phi is the polygenicity for the trait. So it can be in interpreted as the proportion of SNPs with long zero effects. So in PRCS, there are two different models. One is grid model, which we can use a series of phi parameters. Then we will try to find tuning the phi parameter in a uh, tuning cohort to find the optimal value. So the other model is alt model, which can automatically estimate the phi parameters based on our input jewels. So as there are so many different methods, people are always wondering uh, what method will perform best in practice. <laughs> Actually, there is no one fit for methods. So as shown in this figure here, I started on uh, eight different trees, ranging from BMI and height, which are two very polygenic trees, and three leafy trees, which are considered as less polygenic, with some of them being uh, large effects and also three diseases. So I construct the PIS using five different methods, and we can see the x-axis is the uh, target ancestry, and the y-axis are the prediction accuracy of the PIS. We can see from using different methods, um, they actually vary a lot between different uh, traits. So the optimal the optimal PIS methods is highly dependent on the trait specific genetic architecture. And for those methods, who will be more adaptive to different genetic architecture, they are expected to perform better than other methods, such as the basic methods. So extend to the single trait methods, there are also other multi-trait methods which can leverage the wide spread apply ultra between traits, uh, such as uh, shown here, and also some multi ancestry methods which can leverage the shared uh, genetic components between ancestry, such as uh, PICSX and XPBLAB, et cetera. So I will not go for details for those methods as uh, before I move to the next section. I want to check whether there are any questions.
Thank you very much. I, I will just raise one question. Um, a, a couple of slides back, you, you talked about sort of you, you established a range of p-values uh, within which you would um, consider a, a SNP that fell in that range. And I want to make sure I understand where the lower bound comes from there. So the, the red dotted line, is that a is that just multiple correct uh, testing correction or is that by some other means? So for P plus T, uh, when specified the p-value threshold, is can, it is kind of arbitrary. So the lower bound of the p-value can be said to be one. Basically, if it's one, then all SNPs will be included. Then it will start uh, considering the LD pruning step. That's great. Thank you very much. And another question has just popped up, so I will read that now. Um, and the question is, what is the race or ethnicity of the reference GWAS for the PRS results for height and BMI? So uh, in this figure, I am using the European GWAS, so the LD reference panel are uh, just based on European ancestry. So either 1000 genome or you can use other European-based LD reference. Thank you. Um, that's the, the set of questions for now, and I will raise more as they arise. So thanks. Okay, cool. Thank you. So maybe, maybe I can interrupt you. One more has has um, just popped up that I, I missed. I'm sorry for the for the coming on my part. But uh, the question is: Should the grid method of PRS CS be considered to be in danger of overfitting, much as P plus T um, is commonly done by PR size S I C E? Um, I think uh, these two process, they are actually similar. So for P plus T and PRS, so for P plus T, we need to fine tuning the P value thresholds. And for PRS, we are fine tuning the fee parameters. So we are doing this thoroughly in a, uh, independent validation cohort. So I, I don't think the overfitting should be an issue. Thank you. So yeah, I'll continue. So one major limitation of current PIS study is the limited PIS transferability. So as we know, the currently most was they are projected in European ancestries as shown by the red proportion in this figure. So such European-centric bios in GWAS studies would um, lead to the PRS accuracy attenuations when using European GWAS based uh, PRS to low European ancestries. And this can be attributable to a different uh, factors such as the demographic history and the minor allele frequency differences and the LD pattern differences between different ancestries. So to overcome this limitation, there are many ongoing efforts to increase the genetic diversity of the discovery jewels. So here I want to take an example from GLGC, the Global Lipids uh, Genetics Consortium. So in this figure, they generated PIs from different sources of jewels. So all here is uh, re referring to the multi ancestry jewels, and other doors uh, are the single ancestry jewels. So I point the multi ancestry jewels here with the purple arrows. We can see using multi ancestry jewels, the PIs accuracy actually uh, they are comparable to other. Uh, single ancestry GWAS and sometimes are even better. So this demonstrates the uh, power of increasing genetic diversity in improve the PIS accuracy. And our work is uh, a similar effort, which is called the Global Meta-Analysis Initiative or GBMI for short. So GBMI encrypts uh, connected data from different resources like hospital-based or uh, population-based bar banks, a uh, total of 19 and even more currently. So with around 2.1 million SNPs with both genotype and phenotype data. Then for each of the bar banks included in the GBMI before the same um, process to run the PCA analysis by assign, assigning each of the individuals in each of the bar back to uh, six different uh, ancestries, including African, American, Central, South Asian, East Asian, European, and Middle Eastern. 
As we can see here, European actually still accounts for the majority of individuals, around two thirds of the population. And the phenotypes we studied in GBMI, there are a total of 14 different endpoints. They are ranging from uh, very common and well studied in previous studies, such as asthma, chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary diseases, to less studied traits like thyroid cancer. So before constructing those uh, PIs for the 40 endpoints, we first studied a little bit about the genetic architecture of those endpoints. Because for the genetic architecture, such as uh, the sniff-based heritability we talked about a little bit, a little while ago, it will be the upper bound for the PIs accuracy. So in this figure, we showed the sniff-based heritability, the polygenicity, uh, which we also talk about in PRCS, is the proportion of, long, of SNPs with long zero effects and the S parameter. S here is the relationship between the minor allele frequency and the effect sizes, which can be considered as a negative selection measurement. So, the y-axis is the uh, phenotypes which are ranked by the sniff-based heritability. And in each of the panel, the different colors uh, with the orange representing uh, using European-based jewels and the blue color using the multi ancestry jewels. And each of the dashed lines is the corresponding median estimates. So we can see across different traits, the genetic architecture are greatly varied. For example, asthma, it has uh, both high sniff-based heritability and also high polygenicity. But for gout, the sniff-based heritability is also high, but the polygenicity is quite low, which suggesting uh, the gout might have uh, some large effects low side. So after the uh, genetic architecture when they we then start a PRS process. So like previous mentioned, we run GWAS in the discovery cohort, which is uh, GBMI and also some public uh, GWAS. In GBMI, we use leave one out strategies. And then we will do some uh, standard QC steps on the SNPs included in the um, GWAS. And here, we are focused on two PRS construction methods which I talked about earlier, P plus T and PRCS. So after fitting those two PRS methods, we construct the PRS in the target population, including nine different biobanks. Those nine different biobanks are um, actually dependent from the discovery jewels. And we also done some routine QC steps uh, in SNP level or individual level on those uh, biobanks. And finally, we fit a logistic regression by including or not including the PRS together with the covariance in this model. And we use different uh, metrics to evaluate the PRS performance such as the NUC square, R square on the liability scale and odds ratio between different PS structure. So as we talked about earlier for the individual level, for the summary level based methods such as P plus T, we will need a LD reference panel, but for GBMI, uh, it has multi and source traits. So here we try to use different source of um, LD reference panel in 1000 genome, including European, uh, South Asian, East Asian, and African. So in this figure, the y axis is the p value threshold used in p plus t, and the x axis is the prediction accuracy. Each of the, of the panel of the column is the target ancestry and the color is the different early reference. And we found that the gray color, which is the uh, 1000 genome European used as the LD reference, they actually uh, provided us a comparable or better prediction accuracy than using other long European LD reference panel. So we will use 1000 genome European as our LD reference panel. So as shown, 
we use the different p-value thresholds for running pcast and when using different p-value thresholds we will select different number of snips and result in different prediction as well and even for software like precise we will uh, optimize the p-value thresholds in the external validation cohort to select the optimal p-value thresholds which is this uh, p-value threshold with the highest prediction accuracy and we found this optimal threshold is actually dependent on the genetic architecture. So in this figure, the y-axis is still the p-value threshold and the x-axis is the prediction accuracy. So for the phenotypes, they are ranked as the polygenicity estimates. So the right panel is with a higher polygenicity. So for each of the phenotypes, the uh, red color is the estimates uh, in the UKBB, UK Biobank European population, and the blue color is the prediction accuracy in Biobank Japan, which are East Asian population. So we can see for those more polygenic traits, these are uh, optimal p-value thresholds optimal p-value stretch, they are indicated by the asterisk, they are actually much higher than the uh, optimal p-value thresholds in the lower uh, polygenicity traits. And, but this pattern is actually uh, dependent on many other factors such as the genetic ancestry. So the pattern is different for the uh, Biobank Japan in the East Asian population. And they might also be related to the discovery jewels, the environmental factors, et cetera. So the other methods we are using is PRCS. So similar to P plus T, we also try to use different ancestry from 1000 genome as the LD reference panel. And we recapitulate the findings from P plus T. So basically for each of the phenotype we found using the European, which is the grape first grade bar in each of the panel, the short comparable or even better prediction accuracy than other low European early reference panels. As we use two different methods, we then compare their prediction accuracy. So in this figure, the y-axis is the prediction accuracy, the x-axis is the target and source trait. So for each of the column, they are ranked by the SNP based heritability, which are indicated by the dash lines. For each phenotype, the blue colors are the accuracy using two methods in UK Biobank, and the red color are the accuracy in Biobank Japan. So we can see for those traits with a lower SNP based heritability we can hardly see any differences between P plus T and the PICS. But when the SNP based heritability starts to increase, we can actually see the basic methods actually are better than the P plus T method. So overall, we can see the basic methods such as PICS, they can improve the PICS accuracy. And then, we in this study we were focused on PICS when extending to all other biobanks. So when reporting the accuracy for all biobanks, I would like to just use ISMA as an example because ISMA is the most well powered jewels in GBMI. So here the y-axis is the prediction accuracy, the x-axis is the target ancestry, and we use different biobanks. The dash lines is the SNP based heritability for ISMA. We can see there is a general decrease in trends of the accuracy from European to non European. But with the exception here is the accuracy using um, Biobank Japan. Uh, this could be Biobank Japan, which is a um, hospital based uh, cohort, so it has more precise definition for ISMA. And further, we can see even within the single ancestry as shown in European here, we can see some of these biobanks, they actually have lower prediction accuracy than other biobanks, indicating heterogeneous of the accuracy across, across biobanks within the same ancestry. 
So here we are presenting the accuracy using ASCO on the liability scale. But for disease trees, people are always interested in another metric, which is the odds ratio. So here we compared the odds ratio between different PRS strata uh, between the top 10% versus the bottom 10% uh, and versus the middle strata and the remaining strata. So we can see for the overall trend, the, the odds ratio between extreme strata, they are actually higher than um, between other strutters, which indicating the odds ratio using extreme PR strata, they are actually inflated compared to the uh, general population. And odds ratio actually reflecting the same uh, change as as well on the liability scale. So the odds ratio generally decreased from European to low European, and they show heterogeneity, even with the ancestry and the cross ancestries. Um, finally, so GBMI for most of the endpoints, they do have the largest sum size to date. So we want to check how it improved the PRS accuracy given its more diversity and larger sum size. Here we, only, we also focused on ASMO. So we report the prediction accuracy for ASMO in different fire banks. The red bars here are the accuracy using GBMI GWAS and the gray bar here is using the reference GWAS, which is THGC, uh, the previously uh, la largest uh, uh, multi ancestry for the multi ancestry GWAS for ASMA. We can see uh, the GBMI GWAS actually uh, benefits the PIS accuracy in different uh, ancestries and also different power banks. So a uh, short summary for this project, we found firstly, when using P plus T, we found the optimal p-value thresholds. They are actually dependent on a trace specific genetic architecture. And we found for trees, they are more polygenic, they might benefit more by optimizing the p-value thresholds. And the basic method PIS says the overall outperformed P plus T. Uh, even for GBMI, we are following a very standard process uh, from the defining phenotype, running GWAS meta-analysis, and uh, running PIS, et cetera. There is still a uh, widespread heterogeneity of the accuracy of PIS uh, between power banks and also between ancestries. And finally, we found uh, increasing the genetic diversity and increase the sum size of the discovery was they can improve the PIS accuracy. So finally, I'd like to thank all my team members and a special thanks uh, to my supervisor, Alicia, for her support and encouragement. And also all my collaborators for these two publications. And thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Ying, for that really thought-provoking talk. Uh, there is one question that has just popped up that I will read now, and it has, uh, I would say, broadly to do with the question of alleles and their behavior in different environments. So, so the question is, with the low transferability of PR, PRS across genetic ancestries, one might believe that they poorly capture essential biology of disease. Um, and that uh, certain demographic patterns predominantly reflect lifestyle variables. And would PRS be, given this, would PRS be fundamentally limited as a way forward if this is the case? And has there been work on transferability of the same ancestry across lifestyles? Yeah, I, I, I think so. The, the, the reasons behind that is quite complicated. Um, but when just considering the uh, genetic factors, we are prone to assume the uh, genetic, the causal variance between different different ancestries, they are mostly shared, at least for the um, common variance. But for other long genetic factors, especially the environmental factors, they are more uh, complex to model. Yeah, and th th this need to, needs much more work to be put on. 
Uh, thank you. And this is just kind of a follow up question for me. Is there um, potential value in, in identifying environment uh, specific, specifically identifying environment um, sensitive variants by separately considering as different groups, uh, two different ancestries that are of people living in different environments? Is that a way to parse apart those um, sort of variants that do or do not respond to the environment? Or, or maybe there are statistical reasons that that is really, really um, impossible to do. Yeah, I think it's definitely a, a worthwhile point to explore. And actually, our lab is currently uh, working on the UK Power Bank database diverse ancestries and as the genetic uh, predictors coming from PIS only capture part of the variation between ancestries. So we want to integrate uh, more uh, non genetic factors, especially the environment factors, try to explore whether this will in improve the PIS transferability. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, another question has just popped up and I will read that now. Um, so very low polygenicity traits seem like an opportunity to identify causal variants and therefore to have ground truth when thinking about reasons why scores transfer for well or poorly across ancestries. For example, gout, um, is it possible to more directly interrogate why the score doesn't transfer well? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a very good point. So the transferability is kind of uh, reflected by the polygenicity, like uh, the, like James just mentioned. So for some no polygenic traits, we can easily identify the possible causal variants and they, they might be shared. So they are prone, prone to share between ancestries, which means if we identify them, they, they might have higher or more generalizable performance. And for, for the gout specific cases, we found uh, for some uh, associated variants, they actually um, have larger uh, allele frequency in other low European populations than the uh, European populations. So yeah, so it, it is possible to, uh, to explore more how this transfer dependent on the genetic architecture, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, where do you recommend people start if looking for resources on how to ask their, you know, particular genetic risk question in a way that um, has a cross ancestry population? Are there um, particular combinations of public references that you would say are the best to combine at this point? Or um. Uh, well, I would like to say so the PIS, uh, they, they still have major uh, limitations. So as it only captures uh, the part of the genetic variation, so it's far from the uh, trait heritability as well as the sniff-based heritability. So there are only a few cases uh, ready to use for clinical utilities, such as the one I mentioned, the uh, coronary artery diseases and breast cancer. And they, they are not actually, uh, they, they will not be a diagnostic tool, but just uh, integrate with other predictors, such as the lifestyle factors and uh, non-genetic factors. And yeah, they, they will not be, <laughs> So, so currently it's very hard to like implement in the long um, that was in that was because they limited uh, data in other ancestries. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, a, a, another question, which is, what are the formal ways to assess polygenicity? So, if you wanted to sort of ask about <laughs> the uh, number of so variants. Maybe I can just talk about the way I uh, report in my study. So we are running this user software called GCTB. And for the authors, they developed a model SBSS, which is a summary level based BSS method. So they have uh, some multi normal um, points distributions based on the effect sizes. Then but we just report the polygenicity based on their estimates. And they are, there might be some other similar um, ways to uh, report this polygenicity, like by Luke O'Connor's uh, paper, yeah. 
Thank you so much. Um, I do not see any other questions. I don't know if you happen to <laughs> see, see any others, Sarah. Um, if not, well, we will thank you again Ian, for, for a very thought provoking talk and we'll look forward to hearing about um, your, your ongoing work in the future. So thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Thanks.